Hey, No Stroke listeners. David and I appreciate you taking some time out of your day to listen to this episode. If you find our podcast valuable, we ask that you consider supporting us with a small monthly donation. You could head over to nostrokepod.com to become a supporter of the show and help David and I continue to create content for listeners in our stroke community around the globe. Now let's get to today's episode. This is the No Stroke Podcast with your co-hosts, David Dancero and Michael Garrow, helping you to support and thrive in life after stroke. Their podcast is designed for educational and community support purposes only and should not replace medical treatment and guidance of your own health professional team. Welcome to episode 67 of the No Stroke Podcast. My name's Dave Dancero. I'm here with my co-host, Mike Garrow. Good morning, Mike. Good morning. Good morning. A, a nice, you know what, we feel that we're out of the depths of winter, right? It's getting a little Almost. brighter later in the day. The energy is, is picking up and we're, um, we're nearly there. And the, uh, you know the groundhog saw its shadow. Or well, it yeah, shadow. What 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 one was it? I, 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 <laughs> well, there's all kinds of animals now that they, you know everyone's <laughs> trying to come up with their own crazy attention seeking uh, creature. So I I, I saw an, a I saw a possum the other day that they, they were celebrating that the possum shores shadow. But I don't even know what that means, Mike. So, but I have to ask you, where where are you broadcasting from? Because I'm looking out my window and it is, I'm is not right? seeing any signs of spring yet. Well, I mean, I w- I'd be lying if I said it was sunny, but I mean, it, the the sun is trying to. Poke, right. poke out. It's going to be you know, we're for a you know early February day. It's going to be nice and warm. So I'm going to try to All get right. out after this, go for a little walk, and you know, soak it in. All right. Well, um, I'm not going to put you on the spot. And depending when we get this episode out, the, you know, I'm not going to have you have to comment on the on the upcoming Super Bowl here, other than just to say, it reminded me that um, we didn't get the Taylor Swift effect that we were looking for, at least not yet on our, on our side, right? We, a couple episodes back, we were hoping for a little. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Trying to spin the old um, yep. you know, Mike's way. Yeah. I, I don't know how we were going with it, but uh, no, it did not. It did not take effect. You know, Taylor's still uh supporting the multi-billion dollar franchise of the nfl and you know that's okay that's okay that's okay that's now, all right you know so so for now we're gonna have to rely on our individual supporters as you saw on the last uh you know that we we highlighted on the last episode that we now have a support the show feature so we're gonna lean in a little bit on this and also our new uh sponsor spotlight that uh that we'll put at the end of every episode now in the show notes, but we, um, great plug, great plug. And just to differentiate that, right. Just so people are clear, like, right. We would love if, you know, your individuals out there who are, who've enjoyed listening to our show. And if you saw David and I, you know, out, out for a stroll in a pub, would you, would you buy us a a pint or would you get, get us a cup of coffee? Right. And it's like that kind of donation where, you know, as small as $3 a month, you could just do a month, cancel, whatever it is that you'd like. Um, but any any individuals out there who could kind of rally behind, support us, we have a way. If you go onto the website, hit support us. There's a link on the homepage as well as the menu navigation. And it'll bring you off to our new hosting platform, Buzzsprout, which allows for payment options to us. So that would Perfect. that would really help support, just cover our costs, right, of, of hosting, the different platforms that we that we need to use to get this show produced and out um so really encourage folks if you have a couple bucks to spare um you know we would certainly appreciate that support and then if you're an organization business we're, we're going to be doing some partnerships on the business spotlight end as well so there's a way to reach out on the partner partner with us website uh section of the website um and we'd ask you know you guys go through that route so those are the two ways but yeah excited for this um you know move off of you know from the back end platforms and onto buzz route to allow us to uh to get some of this ramped up absolutely so hey mike let's um 
let's jump in as we set the stage for our continued discussion around exercise going into the new year. I'm looking, and, and when we were recording our episode, and we're gonna you're gonna be introducing the guest here shortly. Um, you know, for those YouTube listeners, uh, uh, watchers, uh, we as we were speaking with our guests, I couldn't I couldn't um, couldn't help but notice Mike the the array of exercise equipment you have behind you you have a you have a peloton bike you got a couple of beautiful bikes hanging up there i'm i'm looking to see if there's any wear on those in those tire treads back there i've you know <laughs> but uh you know it made me it made me think uh, you know i it, you know the options that we have for exercise um are vast right but when you are faced with a stroke um sometimes those those options close fast um and I wrote up a, a, a bit of a, an article after our discussion that has been in my mind a lot about um, about what happens after stroke. And if you don't mind, I'm just going to read just one quick quote because it really it really got me reflecting. I, I it, this is if you're if you if you follow our uh, newsletter too, you subscribe. Um, it was a feature post that I took talked about the real problem with stroke. And uh, I wrote in one of the the quotes that movement is medicine to the stroke survivor and taking away access to this vital link to health is criminal. The downward spiral that begins at discharge to home for most stroke survivors happens fast if exercise is discontinued. And what quietly occurs after stroke, after discharge, is what I'd like to discuss in this post. And I encourage you, what I what I go on to speak about is and this resonated with me early on as a physical therapist is this term called sarcopenia which is basically losing muscle mass as we age but when the stroke when a stroke occurs that happens at an accelerated pace and and I think when you were listening to this episode um think about what's happening happening um to the body without exercise and then what happens when we allow opportunities and we're going to talk about um in this case community um, options, um, but also um, there may be needs for special specialized equipment. And when I, you know, I was watching what you had available to you, it's, um, you know, some of us are real, we're blessed to have home exercise options and equipment, but not all that equipment just out of the box adapts to someone with a, with an impairment. So that's kind of what I was thinking about as I honestly, as we were you know, as I was reflecting on that after, but also certainly while we were recording um, and we were interviewing our guests today. Yeah, I think that's, you know, a really good point, David. And, you know, part of the reason why I think we we were, you know, looking forward to speaking um, to our guests here. And the the issue, right, it, it, there, I mean, there's multitude of issues when it comes to access to, to rehab and access to exercise and uh, prescription post stroke. Um, but, you know, how we, so, you know, in today's discussion, um, it's really around the theme of that one, the issue with prescription of exercise, right. And the, the up, upping of a dose, right. Which we always say, like, there needs to be more exercise post stroke, you know, and, and that's, yeah. you know, part of, you know, the disconnect is, it's just not the the level of what you need versus like how you get that right and the access points um so <clears throat> today's guest um is uh coming from the UK so Rachel Young she's a, a physiotherapist with Sheffield Hallam University and works out of their advanced well-being research center um her background is really around neuro rehab exercise prescription and she brings the lens of kind of some of the changes that are happening in the UK around clinical guidelines upping their guidance for hours of physical activity <clears throat> as well as you know just rehab in general so not just exercise but speech and language therapy OT cognitive um, therapy but <clears throat> what caught my eye was an article back in I think it was like just before the holiday period um published out of the health club um what exactly was it um health club management magazine management. um 
a UK publication, but it highlighted stroke, right? And kind of what you were speaking to, right? Like there is no, like what are, what are the things that we need to kind of take into consideration for that survivor to be able to access, right? So is it adjusted um, exercise equipment? Um, and specifically the article that was highlighted with uh, Rachel spoke to the need to kind of pull in local support um, centers, so local fitness centers, leisure clubs, as they call it out in in England and in the um, some of Europe. So, like, how could that fitness club culture become more ingrained as part of the the neuro rehab community, right? And I think when we often talk about fitness there's that scare like the the, you know if we did a poll of similar to how you asked david previously like what come what adjectives come to your mind when you think of like when you just had your stroke right and it's scared you know nervous like these those things transition right into the fitness culture as well because you're intimidated right there's a lack of guidance sometimes so Rachel, the discussion we we have with Rachel is, you know, really looking at that handoff and the opportunity for the fitness centers and, and fitness professionals to come become tightly aligned with physiotherapists, occupational, the rest of your care team, and really provide that linear path towards continuation of your therapy and being able to kind of meet these demands um, that your care team and and now governments are, are putting on you know the the professionals who are there to really hit the you know the the key markers um to hopefully see improvements with stroke um and we also dive into some of the great research happening out of um, her university in partnerships with a connected was it Ernerva was the name of the company, David? Ernerva, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. so yeah, some be... really cool work happening there. Um, kind of reminded me of what the, com- the company you were we were looking yeah. at for a little while. Yeah, that we was... We recorded uh, with them, right? One of our early episodes. That's exactly episodes. The, the, the project that I worked on, uh, TheraCycle, has a, a motor-assisted rehab bike for, you know, in the open air, I mentioned like the Peloton's a great bike, right? Yeah. But for the stroke survivor to try to climb through and get over and get on a bike and maybe, you know, be able to actually pedal in some of the equipment right. that Rachel talks about through her part, through her, the research she did with Nerva is, uh, it shows that they've adapted the strength side of things. So it'd be great to learn more about that. And I'm not sure even if they're here in the States yet, but um, as we in, you know, expand on this discussion around rehab, I think it's something that we should dive into and learn more about for our community as well. But yeah, it definitely made me think of, you know, the one, one in particular, a uh, user of the bike in the project that I was that, you know, we, we, we do, we do get into the, the term plateau, right. And even in this episode, and I mm-hmm. remember when I, you know, when we talk about quantitative and qualitative research, and to me, a lot of times, when you're measuring outcomes on a project and it's a success, sometimes the, 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 the qualitative or the, the, you know, the lived experience comes through and we talk about it, but in the one project that I worked on in relation to the bike here in the States, I, I put a question in about, do you, before the, that we followed this patient with this bike in their home in this particular case. And I said, what, you know, what, what, um, do you feel you've hit a plateau? in your recovery and before having access to this bike they said absolutely yes and at the after following them for just three months they had a whole new outlook because we just gave them the tool to keep their body moving and that led to so many other positive mobility Mm -hmm. and then the full mobility assessment so it's just like you know you can tell i get passionate when we talk about this topic because we're just not doing enough and i think um we have to think outside of the box but think about how we can uh, maybe get folks here doing more like that article you mentioned highlights and what Rachel will highlight on this episode about, um, you know, how they're doing it over there in the UK. Yeah, it's partnerships, right? It comes down to yeah. like we always speak about ourselves and in, in the stroke and advocacy community 
<clears throat> doing things in silos, right? And not enough happening. And it's the same thing in rehab across the, the continuum, right? It, it, there needs to be partnerships to drive true innovation and true change. Um, so, yeah, I think a great example of what Rachel will talk about here with Inerva. Um, and, yeah, and as we continue this conversation, um, next episode will be speaking to a program manager out of Ohio University, and they've really done a great job at bringing in the exercise component as part of the care continuum at Ohio Health. Um, they have a full-blown um, neuro-focused center, and we'll, we'll let Lauren and hopefully we could bring in um, someone who's actually experienced this from the survivor or even caregiver lens, but you know, those adjectives that I was using to describe like the, the fitness culture for so many mm -hmm. were just completely flipped in the article I was reading. Right. Cause it's welcoming. It's, it was yeah. built ADA accessible. Like there's just so many good things as, as that, um, you know, a, as a place where people feel welcome and they're able to come in and, and truly get the, the, the attention and, you know, the, the prescription of exercise that they need. So We'll be excited to to release that episode in a couple of weeks as well. Perfect. All right. Well, let's get into this one. And please, 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 if you are, you know, have been a, a listener of the show and and you have, you know, any way to to support with a small donation a month, um, head over to nostrokepod.com. Um click on the support us banner or through the navigation. Um, and again, small thing if three dollars a month could could help cover some costs here for David and I, and, and we truly appreciate it. So with that, let's get into this one with Rachel Young. Hi, and welcome to the No Stroke Podcast, Rachel. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Enjoying this episode, Mike and I would like to remind you, we now have a show supporter option on our website. Follow the heart button to help support us and continue to make great content possible. We'll give you a shout out on the show too when you do. We appreciate your generosity. Hi there. Nice to be here. Yeah, of course. We're um, excited to have another guest here from the UK. We, we had, uh, now I think you're our third or fourth guest most recently we had uh, avril drummond on um and spoke to that was probably spring of 2023 and spoke to some of the new the guidance at the from an, the national clinical guidance for stroke that launched um and today you know we're, we're looking forward to diving into some of the updated guidance um at the national level there in the uk around stroke rehab and Really, the fascinating work that you're doing um, at a to promote exercise and community-based fitness options for stroke survivors. So, um, with that, let's let's kind of jump in and give give a bit of background. You know, as you came up, with, what what inspired you to become a physio, and what's you know motivating that change now into into the research world that you're into. Yeah, so um, we're going back to the early 90s now, I'm giving my age away, but um, I, I knew that I probably wanted a career in healthcare, um, but wasn't sure which, which discipline, and um, got a job in a nursing home, so I was working as a healthcare assistant in a nursing home, and, and several of the residents nursing home um, had had strokes and the, the impact that those strokes had had upon their lives was was devastating um so a lot of them were hoist dependent had lost all independence in activities of daily living and in some cases communication as well um but i, I always enjoyed caring and, and working with with those individuals and I also often felt that maybe there had been more recovery somewhere in there had they been given more of an opportunity as well. So possibly whilst helping somebody to, to get dressed or, or in bathing, you'd see that the toes wiggle or you'd see a movement or a muscle contracting. 
and, and my feeling was that, that there was there was more to be achieved in, in stroke rehabilitation than was being delivered um and and that inspired me towards physiotherapy and, and looking at movement recovery obviously as an undergrad physio i went through various different specialities and i enjoyed them all but very quickly in my early career particularly focused upon neurological rehabilitation and stroke um so there's been a lot of changes um over, over the last 20 to 30 years certainly back in the 90s we tended to avoid exercise prescription in stroke rehabilitation and particularly strength exercises were regarded as, as potentially harmful but now we're in a new re, new era of evidence where we can see that actually exercise cardiovascular and resistance training are really beneficial for people who are living with stroke um, but challenges remain and particularly for those people with more complex motor impairment there are some real challenges around enabling that exercise prescription so that that's inspired me into, into this field of research as well Rachel it's it's, it's great to meet you um I always enjoy having another physio on the show and and your background uh made me instantly think of um a former guest we had, David Petrino. I think you're probably our fourth or fifth physio on now, but uh, Dr. Petrino here in the States, um, he made a comment that resonated towards the end of his podcast where it might have been his magic wand question, but uh, answer, but it was put, put yourself in the place when you're doing research, put your place, put self in the place so you have that lived experience of the the population you're trying to serve or you're trying to innovate in. And I think leading into your conversation, our conversation today, I really want to dive into like, was there a certain point where you made that switch into research and maybe like, what did you always have that in the back of your mind or what, 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 what um, brought you to that next step of your career? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And um, I think one of the challenges um, a lot of physios and, and other healthcare professionals face is that there's a, there's a huge amount of, of enjoyment in, in actually being a clinician. Um, I, don't, I don't think I've ever stopped being a, a clinician at heart. Um, but you also increasingly see those unanswered questions and, and those challenges where you think i'm sure there, there is a solution out there um so so for me th there wasn't ever a hard boundary between my clinical career and the research career i've morphed into it um over over the years but it's been inspired by um those increasing questions and challenges and i think that, you know a big challenge we face in the uk and i suspect globally is that rehab packages are typically finite um but people live with the, the impact of a stroke for the rest of their lives so it's how do we find that lifelong solution um and, and how might that look for different individuals so um but i, I still always identify first as a, a physiotherapist and um i really enjoy projects where i'm involved in intervention delivery as well because that's still drawing upon those those clinical roots so when you're outside of the world of stroke rehab and, and research, um, you know, you're from Sheffield, England. Um, what what fun things do you get up to? What, what keeps you busy outside of the clinic walls? Yeah, so um, I've got a family, two teenage children um, and, and, and husband and dog. So um, it, we enjoy time together. We live quite near a national park, so enjoy getting into the, the fresh air of, of a weekend, especially. Um, I like riding my bike. Um, so generally enjoy exercise, enjoy being outside, um, particularly enjoy be, being around my family and, 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 and the dog. I think I'm also mindful of that not being everybody's cup of tea as well. That, uh, you have to be reflexive, don't you? So uh, for, for me, as being a physio and, and being someone who enjoys exercise and activity on a personal level, I think it's it's important for me sometimes to, as David said, get into that place where actually you're putting yourself into somebody else's world where that might not have been their thing, um, you know. So I'm mindful of that when I talk about my, my interests and my personal life that I, I, I try not to impose that on on everything I do professionally as well. Yeah, 
Yeah, we David and I we had an episode before the holidays, and you know our theme was around fitness, kind of finding what works for you, right? And that's that's the biggest challenge. You know, it's it's so often a chore for people, you know, and it's trying to find that intrinsic motivation or something that you're you're getting joy out of as well. And by doing that, you, you know, it's also a form of exercise. Um, so that that's you know lovely to hear and. I know we hopefully we, you closed the door on your on your dog, so I don't I don't know if we'll have an appearance, but you wouldn't be the first to have a, a dog walk in on the podcast. Um, yes. So I know I I mentioned um, at the beginning of the show uh, we had Avril Drummond on late last year, um, <clears throat> and she was um, she really spoke to the new guidelines set at. I believe it's the UK and Irish level um, and national clinical guidelines around stroke, right? Um, all with it, and there, and it's fantastic um, that rehab and support post-stroke was such an emphasis there, right? Because for so long, you see, you know, all the needles moving at the the acute phase, right, and, and prevention phase, which which makes a lot of sense. But there needs to be just as much kind of focus within this post-stroke side as well. Um, so we looked at, um, you know, that conversation with Avril, but there was again, just recently, um, and maybe you could kind of speak to the difference of these recommendations at, you know, the, the national level, but there were the national clinical guidelines for stroke and then what NICE has recommended. Mm -hmm. So the National uh, National Institute for Healthcare Excellence um, recommendations. So can you just, you know, briefly kind of explain the difference maybe between those two um, at the national level, if, if you can. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we'll kind of talk to what those guidelines are now per asking of providers. Yeah, so the it was a big year in, in stroke in the in the UK um, and certainly the UK national guideline for stroke, which was launched in March and um, sent a ripple, which was then, I think, um, kind of reinforced by the, the NICE guidelines as well. The NICE guidelines do have a, a strong steer on service delivery within the National Health Service in, in the UK. And there was a lot of parallels. There was a lot of parallels between the, the two two sets of guidelines and I'll be honest the set of guidelines where I'm more familiar is with the the earlier ones the the UK national guideline for stroke which which came out last March um you know so specifically sections on the very early mobilization following stroke the inpatient and very early post discharge intensity of therapy and then that 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 long term care and and there's some things which really jump out in, in those recommendations. So certainly looking in those very early days following stroke, there's a recommendation that for, for everybody who is medically stable, that they are actually mobilized within that, that first 24 to 48 hours. Um, and that there's a very early assessment to determine what level of support might be needed to enable that, that getting out of bed. Um, so, for example, if someone does have a motor impairment or a sensory impairment, that they get the expert assistance to to facilitate that transfer out of bed. And the emphasis on those early days appears to be little and often um, so that there aren't prolonged periods in bed, maybe but followed by one bout of sitting out for 30 minutes that people throughout the day are getting in and out of, of bed and experiencing being upright and the demand that has on the postural system the cognitive perceptual stimulation that you'll get from sitting up as well reorientation to a world that must be feeling and looking very different in in those early days i think the challenge there is for the workforce isn't it because if we're looking at frequent uh, mobilization little and often which i absolutely agree is clinically the best thing to to deliver for people with very early stroke but, but the demand on the workforce to deliver that frequency, uh, I think will be one of the challenges that they're facing. Um, moving down, certainly the, the emphasis, the recommendation for three hours of therapy a day. And I think that, that has sent a, a, a very strong ripple through the rehab community. Um, and actually it's also suggested that people are active for six hours a day as well. So there's 
three hours of therapy led activity, but a further three hours of, of general activity, which might be stimulated through tech or equipment or, um, you know, some somebody's family members or, or visitors. Um, and, and is that like six hours in a certain time, like time window poster or how, like, is that just a continue? Like, I mean, six hours of exercise as much as you love riding your bike that's a long bike ride you know like <laughs> what, what's the time period that they're suggesting that so per day and it would be with intermittent bouts of, of rest in between those those hours of activity um but it's it's still it, it's saying that throughout the day there should be pockets of activity and, and stimulation right. um, but like within that, the first three months the first six months like what what like progression so i'd have to I would have to check back into the small print to be sure of my answer there on, on the guidelines. The um, my impression is that it's during the inpatient stay and then into the, the the community rehab package as well. I'm not sure that they do stipulate a time scale on it, but what they do talk about is those people who are still making progress, where there's still goals to be achieved, that that, that therapy should be delivered indefinitely again that that's i think a, a very positive message but but one that comes with with challenges as well and and that that total time too and i know there's that window is it three is it six is somewhere in between but it it's also cumulative including you know including cognitive training speech and language it, this is like mike said it's just not we don't want to mislead, especially with people who have different survivors have different severity of impairment, because if you tell them this is what you need and it's here on top of the mountain, um, I think that chunking it and making it, you know, doable, I think is, is the big challenge. There was a really, Mike pointed out a really good article that was featured in, in the title, I think was everyone, it was uh, rehab management magazine, right? Mike, where everyone was, the title was everyone's talking about stroke rehab. And I think um, it was a fantastic um, overview. And, and that's where I read about your story too. Uh, but it's, it's certainly more like Mike and I way back when would oversimplify it. You know, stroke rehab is more than two sets of 10 reps, right? Uh, and it's certainly, uh, a part of the whole behavior change component. So can we talk about some of the barriers um, that you would, that, that you know, perhaps you, you actually hit on in your article, but what are some of the special um, accommodations that someone would be faced with or need in a community-based setting to make that fit appropriate? Yes, it's, it's a good question because, again, in the guidelines, um, we're looking at exercise sessions into the, the long term, um, post-discharge home from hospital three to five times a week, exercising at a, a high aerobic intensity. So it's talking about greater than 70% of, of your peak heart rate. And, and then there's a resistance training prescription as well. So finding the right facility that can support people in engaging with that is, is, is really important and a challenge. And I think what we have in the UK are examples of outstanding practice. There's a, a facility, be it a leisure centre or a therapy centre, usually sat within our third sector um, where um, people can access an excellent experience and really tailored support. But we also know that there's there's large areas where such facility isn't easily available. Um, I think it, it it it's there's not a one size fits all answer ever, is there? But I think it very much depends on on that individual's pre stroke experience of exercise, how confident they might feel in in an exercise setting, what what their early preferences might have been about exercise. Um, I think it's about your initial impressions of a facility that first five minutes in anywhere can can last forever can't they so if they've had a, a real difficulty parking the car or or finding the venue and then they get they get there and the the door won't open or there's a turnstile that they can't get through that that's all piling up for an experience which they might not want to repeat so i think getting that first five to ten minutes right is really important so 
whether it's about facility providers offering a, a pre-session call where you might have a video call, know who, what everybody looks like, your familiar faces for each other, um, talking through the venue, what to expect, um, you know, if it's tricky to find or tricky to park, what their top tips might be, and just having a familiar face and a name to, to report to when they go in. And particularly for those people who might not have either a, a family member or friend or, or trusted professional to go to go with them, that, that's so important to, to navigate a place like that on your own is, is really out facing. So something around that, that, that personal touch, I think is really important. Yeah. And that's before that's you've, you've, yeah, you've got into the exercise space itself. Yeah. 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 yeah and that's the biggest, right. Getting that first step in the door. I know from my mother's own case, you know, it took her nearly 20 years to think about entering a, a, a you know, community-based fitness facility. And, you know, thankfully center and local to us where we grew up was, you know, partnered with local hospitals, did a lot of like cardiac rehab, um, things of that nature. So we're kind of geared towards a uh, neuro population, but the biggest challenge is, you know, really that, you know, the fear of stepping into the facility, kind of being out of place. And then, and, I, and I'd be curious kind of how you guys are, are thinking through this. Um, one would be kind of the handoff, right? So the challenges I see with, with kind of one, just this advance ask from a guidelines perspective of this much of rigorous exercise, right? It's whose responsibility is it for that patient to be handed off, right? Like that transition of care, right? Because often that's where the biggest gap is, right? It's saying, okay, you've worked with me now, you know, you're, you're in a physio setting, we've been in the clinic. Um, now, like, what, like, who's connecting the dots, you know, when you're leaving your physio, and your time's up, you've used up all your physio hours. And now we're saying, okay, we're going to get you into the local YMCA or community, you know, leisure center, like, is it up to the pay the survivors themselves, the care team to like, to facilitate know about these, these centers? Um, and maybe there's not that pathway there right now. But in your mind, like for this to work, how, how do those dots need to be connected? Yeah, so there needs to be overlap. I think, um, you know, it, it shouldn't look like a stepping stone across a river. It should look like a, a bridge <laughs> um, where there's seamless transition be between different settings and, and different sectors as well. So our, our NHS, our National Health Service in the UK, it cannot deliver this intensity of therapy and exercise which is recommended um, for for all people with stroke for, for the rest of their lives it is finite it's a finite resource and it has to be a finite service but what i would suggest and again there are examples where this happens is where you almost have a long thin um involvement with somebody so the clinician who works with you in the hospital setting also is involved with your home-based rehab and involved with your transition into an exercise or, or third sector venue as well with maybe you know um, an open-ended discharge where there's, there's arrangements for a phone call or something two to three months later how's it going are you still going to the class did it suit you do you want to try and find a different venue if it isn't working for you um i think also, healthcare providers do need to make it their business to know who their local operators and providers are. That should be absolutely part of the provision that there's really good signposting onwards. It's not enough just to give a flyer out, is it, to say, oh, that's a good exercise class, you should give it a go. About 5% of people might actually have the, well, both the self-efficacy and the resource to, to, to do that on their own. For everybody else, you, you need to accompany them on those initial visits. Yeah, that, that is an extremely important point, Rachel. And, and, I, I, and to, hit, to, to, to maybe in part answer the other half of Mike's question about whose job is it, um, it's the treating therapist at discharge, but there are a lot of, um, in, in my opinion, from, from personal experience, you're not doing your job like if you are not aware of what those community resources are. And in my case, I would actually I'd go on a Saturday and find in the community I'm treating 
if I'm making recommendations to exercise and I don't know what equipment they have in their facility, I'm not, I, I'm basically handing them a piece of paper or a video based program that could be useless if they don't have, and, and you can, and we know you can, you can do a lot of work with little equipment, but the other half of your, you had a really good point about how do you make that first contact point less intimidating? Maybe, maybe there's a, a transition point where you do go in with your physio on that first in, in an ideal world. And the other part, you mentioned a really good point about maybe it's video and maybe it's that first remote contact, or maybe it's an asynchronous recording where someone gives that potential um, new member a, a, a virtual tour so that they know what the potential obstacles or how, what they can prepare for on that first session. But I'm, I, I, I know we're going to uh, jump into break here in a second, but I, we talked earlier about severity of in, impairment and the equipment that is, might be necessary. Um, I think it was in the article we mentioned earlier. Um, there was a particular type of equipment that really intrigued me that I don't think we have here in the States. It, it, it's a, it, it's a, 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 a motorizer and assisted. Can you talk about, um, I think in your article, you, it it was a Nerva. Can you talk a little bit about that? It's powered equipment um, that might help get yeah, over. So, um, uh, uh, absolutely. So, Innerva manufactures seated whole body power assisted exercise equipment. Um, I met the company about 10 years ago now at a conference, and it was in the wake of a lot of research around exercise prescription for stroke and the challenge that we've already identified that particularly if you're living with complex impairments, following an exercise program using conventional equipment is challenging. Um, so the equipment actually, um, the, the, seat, the, the user is in a, a seated supported position um, and there are usually four moving components one one for each limb they move in different directions so there's about nine different seated machines some machines move um, inwards and outwards through adduction abduction some move through with pedaling or cycling motion some actually stimulate or assist movement of the, the trunk as well so for example rotation which is often one of the forgotten movements but so important for, for balance and walking um, so so we've built a relationship over the years we've we've worked together on several research projects um we're looking at the technology which sits around the equipment as well to help with dosage uh, and, and progression of exercise programs so it's one example of, of motorized exercise where the user does join in with the effort so a bit like on an e-bike and um, there's a motor there which is like having a tailwind it will help you along but the user is also encouraged to join in with that effort, that movement effort, so that we see in a cardiovascular and a muscular response to that movement as well. Yeah, I think, and you know, just with the with this type of equipment, right? Like, you know, if we, we'll get to your magic uh, wand question at the end here, but. Wouldn't it be nice if every center could have something like this, right? Because it is such an important aspect. And I think just before we, we get to break here, I think just the other important aspect of, you know, this community-based model and, and getting folks into getting survivors through that pathway and into a center, right? It's it's the trust of the facility and then the provider and the equipment, right? How do we build that model where, you know, maybe it's, you know, physios like yourself and, and others training more like their or PTs or, you know, tr like fitness professionals, maybe, you know, at the, at the ground level who's providing this care on some of these, you know, pieces of equipment and just caring for a neuro population, right? Because I think that's an all that's also one of those big barriers is, you know, having trust in who you're working with, right? And for a the survivor moving through that pathway, knowing that they've had this physio for, for X amount of weeks or, and, or timeline, right? And now you're moving into the community level. How do we keep that handoff as seamless and, and the trust still there that their best intentions are staying with me? So yeah, there's, you know, great opportunity to, um, you know, continue to really speak about this, um, 
you know, transition model and, and how we could better support and, and, you know, hopefully achieve the, the guidelines set um, at a national level. But as we're showing, right, so many barriers there. Um, but I know you, you, your team, the rest of, you know, the clinicians are in the UK are doing the best that they can. And, you know, there, there will be challenges, but I'm excited to kind of see how this progresses over. There's some great work that you've been leading um, at Sheffield Hallam University. And, you know, this, the kind of area that you're in, uh, specifically the Advanced Wellbeing Research Center. So do you want to speak to what this research or what the center's mission is, kind of how that's built in within the university? Um, and then we could kind of transition, talk to some of the latest research that you've been focused on. Yeah, absolutely. So the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre um, was opened in 2020. So you can imagine what that first year was like and then some of the challenges we encountered in the wake of the pandemic. Um, but it's absolutely thriving. And um, the mission of the Advanced Wellbeing Research Centre is to develop innovations which enable human movement. So it's a space where um, it's a multidisciplinary space where we have healthcare professionals, exercise scientists, sports engineers, psychology, um, sociology. We have a real interdisciplinary mix. Um, so it helps us to develop ideas for collaborative projects for, for you know, whole systems solutions as, as well. So um, we're lucky we've got dedicated space for exercise, movement analysis, fitness testing alongside maker space where um, engineers prototype and, and develop new technologies as well. So I feel lucky to be part of the, the, the research centre and it certainly helped us with, with the projects that we're delivering at the minute. Um, so, so in particular, a couple of the projects that we're working on at the minute, one is around assisted gamified exercise for all. So that was funded by Innovate UK. We mentioned Innova. Um, exercise equipment so they're our industrial um, collaborator on the project um, and we, we're looking at gamifying the technology so some of the early um, feedback around Innova equipment was that the users said they really enjoyed the equipment they felt that they were getting fitter and stronger by using it but there was nothing to quantify their performance so imagine if you got on a treadmill, but it didn't tell you how far you'd walked or run, it would feel a bit disappointing. So that was the parallel experience reported by users of the equipment. So this, this project, um, working with sports engineer colleagues, has developed effort detection technology so that now users can monitor their progress, set new targets for, for um, the next exercise session. And um, we're, we're just into the final couple of months of, of, of the project now um, with, with a prototype that, that that's ready for commercialization. So it, it's been a great project to be part of and, and to advance that equipment. Um, so it is a better fit for many, um, dosage and measuring user progress. Um, another project, I think we, we just touched on this earlier, but that I thought it was a systematic review, but worth mentioning, we, we looked at qualitative data um, captured from people with stroke who'd attended community exercise sessions, really to understand more about the, the lived experience of taking part in venue-based exercise following stroke. Um, so some of the strong themes that came out from that were around the value of peer support and particularly working alongside other people with stroke as well. So there was great value with that. Um, it appeared that the group sessions had better attendance and, and better reported benefits compared to one-to-one -one sessions, um, surprisingly, maybe not surprisingly, um, but also that there was mixed views about the difference between a fitness instructor and a, or an exercise professional and a physiotherapist as well. So for some of the participants, they felt that um, the, the exercise professional was a substitute for physiotherapy. However, others felt that they'd been more pushed by their exercise professional, that the exercise professional had been more inspiring. 
and actually um, re referred to physio as being a bit half baked in comparison. So some some real mixed views out there. Uh, it was certainly a quote for, for me as a physio that, that, that stuck in my head. Uh, I think about We're, people wanting to feel challenged. Yeah, yeah, we speak a lot to like the role that a health coach could play within the model, right? You see that a lot built within a model of, for like um, diabetes prevention, diabetes management, right? Is is how that motivational interview, but that's that's interesting um, feedback. Um, I, I was just curious on that study, were, were these group classes, were they all in-person, hybrid, some like all virtual? What what were the, what would that model look like? Yeah, so most of the studies were conducted between 2010 and 2018. Um, so yeah, there was no hybrid, no no digital or remote component to it. They were all venue-based exercise programs. Uh, but something else that emerged was that um, regardless of severity of impairment, the, the user experience and the perceived benefits were very similar. So some of the projects had only accepted people with high levels of mobility, whereas others had also included people who were non-ambulant. And yet the messaging was very similar across the, that, that, that range of participants. First, uh, I love that you're captioning that qualitative, that, that user experience, the feedback is to the point we started at early in the first half talking about really if you want to know what's working you know ask 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 the user and in this case um the feedback that you're getting um the the technology for the biofeedback on the actual technology of the bike is very important and it sounds very interesting and by the way are you hiring in the lab it sounds like a real fun place to work um <laughs> I, I, the, the commute might be a little tough for me but um it sounds like uh really really great work that you all are doing there um, and Mike, Mike brought up a point before we get to the magic wand question, he, he talked about the value in like a health, like a health coach for diabetes care management. And one thing that's always, um, sort of been a thorn in my side with, with, with stroke and recovery. Um, and if we use like the continuous glucose monitor in pre-diabetes management, for example, it gives valuable insight. It gives ability to adjust diet, you know, um, really improve the life of someone with diabetes. In stroke, we don't have a connected ecosystem or I always, I, it's always been like, I live and die by literally by my Apple watch. And it's a metric that I've used since, you know, since it came out and before that I was using older technologies, but we don't, you know, in the case of a stroke, that CGM should be continuous gate monitoring. We don't have really, um, a way to monitor longitudinal change over time for the better, or for the worse. I don't know if you have any thoughts of, about, you know, are, are you working on something like that in your lab or how, like, are you capturing any data that there's, is there a carryover from those, from the equipment they're using, to what that translates to um, better mobility and better functional movement when they go out in the community? Yeah, I, th I think we're, um, it feels, like we're just about to walk into those territories don't we so we, we've seen the impact that wearables are having on on quite a big um, proportion of the population but but not specifically the stroke population as yet um but i think that opportunity is absolutely there and will be explored um the the assisted gamified exercise for all project to mention does include development of an app so people can reflect on the sessions and 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 look at progress we don't yet know what their experience or engagement with that's going to be um, so we will find out um, i know some of my colleagues who work in cancer rehab they'd attempted to introduce wearables as, as part of their their service and in some cases it had gone well but in other cases i think just just using the technology particularly at a time in life where people are facing a lot of challenges a lot of disruption they actually found that the uptake was um, as, as good as they'd expected. So it, it's similar to how we need to walk people through the barriers to going to, to exercise. I think we need to really walk people through the barriers which they will encounter when looking at technology and wearables as well. I don't think it's enough just to issue something and expect people to, to get on with it and get and engage with it. It, it needs to be supported, doesn't it? 
Yeah, and it it really sounds like interesting work that you're doing, especially with with Inerva. Like we've we've seen what the likes of Peloton has done for community based fitness, especially through COVID, right? When all the centers closed, and it really brought that group together. And just from a gamification point of view, right? Like what that in that motivation that it uh, right and and to your points around data capture right it's you know every time you get on you're trying to beat that last time and and there's always a sense of community motivation and if we could bring something like that to the stroke community and you know the wider neuro population right it's it's just going to break the barrier of you know what we talked about around exercise being a chore right how do we be you know make something that fits for all and and you know we're able to you know continue to to see improved outcomes um for this population so um we'd love to maybe you know speak is inerva part of your university pro was it like a spin out company or how how did they like how how that partnership work because we'd love to maybe have you know have them on as a follow-up episode to this yeah, I'm sure they'd be delighted. So they're um, a, a company in their own right, and they've, okay. they've established for over 30 years, and the, their equipment has evolved to, I think, respond to, to very changing population needs. Um, so um, we, we are an academic collaborator with Innova, so um, we're there to help them to develop their technology to to meet the needs of particularly clinical populations uh, and then to to evaluate that technology and and also moving towards measuring the effectiveness of of that type of exercise as well so um yeah it's an academic industrial collaboration okay that's great to hear and and important you know building that foundation of evidence and kudos to them because that's a that's a long and hard process um and kudos to you for being innovative to to kind of work with them so it's a great partnership um and hopefully we'll we'll see more of the likes out there so you know anything um top of mind maybe before we get into our magic wand question that we didn't cover you'd like to to call out um give some time Um there's so many things to think about and talk about that's fair. That's fair. maybe we'd have to have we'll have to have you back. Yeah. I, th- I think um, um probably one one final point is is um uh, you know it's never a, a linear pathway is it for, for anyone living with with the after effects of stroke so you know someone might be doing really well for six months they might be engaging in exercise and um you know returning to their everyday activities but it might only take something like a bad cold or a family bereavement or, or a setback at work. Um, and, and your resilience is already changed after stroke, isn't it? And I think it's remembering that often people need help along the way as well. So I think waving people off at nine months when they appear to be doing well, there needs to be some sort of safety net to pick up maybe when something's changed for them either physically or or in terms of their psychosocial well-being as well so that'd be just one one additional point there yeah and that that might lead into yeah your your magic wand right um you know when we if we were to hand you this magic wand right and some of these challenges and things that we've spoken about and and innovations that are coming into the space how would you take that wand and and redesign the stroke care pathway Yeah, it's a big question. I think um, I absolutely acknowledge the challenges faced, particularly by my, my colleagues who work in the National Health Service. Um, I, I attended the UK Stroke Forum um, in December last year, where Professor Avril Drummond um, chaired a, a session on Have Your Say, and uh, I really heard some of the challenges articulated there. So any magic wand that I might start to talk about now comes with an absolute acknowledgement of, of the, the real world challenges faced by um, all of our colleagues in, in stroke services and, and on that front line. Um, but in that, that blue sky world, we, with um, you, you know, plenty of, 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 of resource and um, workforce and everything else that's required, I think for me, 
with my physiotherapy and my exercise hat on, it will be about normalising exercise right from the start. Um, one of my colleagues at the research centre, he, he did some a project which looked at recumbent cycling, assisted cycling exercise um, between days two and seven following stroke. Um, the findings uh, indicate that it was a, a feasible and safe intervention to deliver. So that's an, another field of uh, a programme of research which we, we aim to develop um, here in, in Sheffield. So it's sending that message out right from the start that exercise will be a part of your recovery um, and it, it will help both in terms of physical but also psychosocial well-being um, following stroke. And then, as we mentioned earlier, it's maybe having um, a different modelled workforce where you get longer involvement with the same trusted clinician that you, at the moment, it can be quite disjointed. You're on an acute unit, then a rehab unit, and then out to the community, and then possibly into a exercise setting, but you'll be meeting different professionals right along that, that pathway. And if there's a way of having somebody who's involved throughout that recovery process, you know, six to 12 months indefinitely, then I think that would really help for them to get to know you, what, what's likely to work for each individual, what the best fit will be for them as they, as they move through the next stage of their recovery. Yeah, that, that those are excellent in some, points. In summary, the magic idea. wand. No, I, I love that yeah. idea and the magic wand in part of that connected care transition to have sort of a lead physio overseeing and being part of the care transition changes until discharge and then out in the community. So just, we, we usually end with any, any last words or any, um, you know, we, we always put your, um, bio information and anything we referenced in the show, including that rehab care management article that, um, we, we spoke to about everyone's talking about rehab. So this was a great discussion on exercise today. Um, one of my favorite topics, it is the best medicine for all of us, but especially for the stroke survivors. So, um, any last words, Rachel, before we, um, end this episode? I think to absolutely, um, make sure that the, the concept of recovery plateau is, um, dropped once and for all. <laughs> it does the nasty exit. word plateau, right? Yeah. Um, Fantastic. People have the potential to change for, for years and years beyond stroke. Absolutely. Yeah. And, <clears throat> you know, it's changing that mindset and, and encouraging, right? It's, you know, there's some fascinating work here in the state to company Vivistim, right? They're, they're, you know, re really rewiring the brain to, to see these changes even 20 years post stroke, right? So it's, um, as much as people want to maybe get out of their do exercise routine post stroke, right? It's, you know, there's no reason to say, ah, oh, this doesn't matter anymore, right? Because there is that ability to continue to see improvements. So, um, yeah, thank you for, for joining here, Rachel. It's been a great conversation. Thank you very much for inviting me onto the show. I've really enjoyed meeting you both and having the opportunity to speak today. So, so I really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the No Stroke Podcast. Be sure to tune in each week for more knowledge on stroke recovery in the brain with tips, technology, and interesting stroke thriver interviews where they share their success to enable you on your own healing journey. Make sure to hit the follow button on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to our show. Mike and I will love to ask you to rate and review our show to enable us to grow our audience. 
please check the show notes to follow us on social so you can connect and reach out to find more about advertising with us or becoming a guest on our show. Until next time, stay well, keep the faith, and keep moving forward.